Okay, good morning from Southampton. Good afternoon, good, af good evening, depending on where you are joining us from. I'm Emily Reid, and I'm Professor of International Economic Law and Sustainable Development in the Law School at the University of Southampton. And I'm also our Director of Internationalization, which means that I have oversight over all of our international activities, both in terms of education and in terms of research. And the first thing I'd like to do is welcome you to this morning's webinar, well, this morning's for us, to this webinar, which is designed to give you a little more information both about Southampton Law School. Um, you may have already seen the introduction to the school, which was provided by the head of school, Professor Brenda Hannigan. But this webinar is designed to give you a little bit more information both about the school and also about the LLM program, which you have expressed interest in, applied for, and hold, currently hold an office for perhaps. And so that is the LLM in International Commercial and Corporate Law. And one of the things that we'd like to do this morning is give you a little bit of an idea of the kind of teaching that we offer within the school. And so the format for the webinar is that after this brief introduction, Professor James Davey, who is Professor of Contract and Commercial Law, will give you a brief taster lecture just to give you an idea of what our teaching is like. And the subject of his lecture is inter business interruption insurance and catastrophic events. So it has quite a lot of contemporary relevance, as you might imagine. Following on from Professor Davies' lecture, there will be an opportunity for you at the end of his lecture to ask some questions about the substance of the lecture, about what he has been talking about. But after that, then Professor Uta Cole, who is the director of the LLM programmes, all of the LLM programmes within the law school at the University of Southampton, will give you a brief talk and presentation about, with a little bit more information about the programmes. And after Professor Cole's talk, then there will be a question and answer session in which you can ask any questions, either returning to Professor Davies' lecture, or you can ask any questions that you have about the programme, the specific programme, the law school, Southampton, really anything that you want more information about. So that will be your opportunity towards the end. And after that, we'll close the webinar. And if you do have any questions arising after the event, we'll provide you with contact details so that you can follow up even if you don't, even if things are, occur to you afterwards. So without any further hesitation or procrastination, what I would like to do is now hand you over to Professor Davey. Hello, right, uh, and uh, good morning. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about insurance today. So uh, I've got a few slides uh, that I'm going to use, uh, which hopefully I will be able to bear with you. Right, so um, my specialism in particular uh, lies around insurance. And uh, what I'm going to discuss uh, this morning is an issue of really enormous contemporary significance. So this is the way in which insurance can and, and will respond to the kind of current COVID-19 outbreak and, and the effect which it has on, on economies uh, globally. Um, one of the things uh, that we need to do to understand really law at a kind of advanced level, working at a master's level, is to make sure that we understand the, the kind of business processes, the markets that we're talking about. It's, it's not just enough to kind of look at the case law. And so uh, the kind of research-led teaching that we will undertake will often uh, look to explain to you the kind of wider context in which the law and, and, and particular points of litigation arises. So uh, when we think about insurance and how it responds to catastrophic losses, we need to think about the nature of the losses and how this is different for insurance markets. So generally speaking, um, insurance works by what we call risk pooling. So that's bringing together lots of losses that are broadly speaking the same, but which are a technical phrase uncorrelated. So what that means is if we take something like uh, motor insurance, we don't know who will have a motor accident in any given year. But if we bring together 100,000 people, and they're all insured with the same insurer, and they all have roughly the same level of risk, it becomes reasonably predictable 
to work out um, on average how many claims there will be in that 100,000 people. So this is a, a mathematical process. It's, it's called the law of large numbers. It's not a, a human law, it's a, it's a mathematical law. So the more times that I run a risk, the more predictable the outcome becomes. So insurers can take in a certain amount of premium from each of the people, put that in a big pot of money, invest it, and be fairly confident uh, within certain bounds how much money they'll be paying out. There'll be good years and there'll be bad years, but the difference between the good year and the bad year will be relatively small. So one of the great things that insurance does is to make the unpredictable reasonably predictable. And insurance is incredibly effective in economies at helping to smooth out those kind of incidences of good and bad luck that, that happen across, uh, uh, across societies and economies. So how is COVID-19 different? How are pandemics, how are catastrophic losses different? Well, they're not uncorrelated. So uh, they are what we would call the opposite, a correlated loss. So uh, if we go back to my example of a motor insurance, the fact that someone has a car accident in Leeds doesn't make it more likely that someone else will have a car accident in London. The, the two losses are, risks are independent of each other. But pandemics don't work like that. The fact that someone has an outbreak of a highly infectious disease in Leeds makes it much more likely that there will be losses in London. So with a correlated loss, something like a, an infectious disease like COVID-19, we have a domino effect the chance of a second loss is much higher because a first loss has occurred. And this means that the chance of a third loss is much higher and a fourth loss and so on. You get that domino effect. And so unlike normal kind of insurance products, normal kinds of risks that the markets are fairly comfortable with, so issues like car accidents or accidents at work or those kind of things that are independent risks, correlated loss looks very different because most years what you'll have is no loss at all. And you can go a very long time with no real losses at all. But then the bad year will be horrendously expensive, huge amounts of losses all flowing from each other. So the knock-on effect means that you end up either with very low levels of loss or very high. So the difference between the good year and the bad year is enormous, much, much greater than when the motor accident standard kind of risks. So this causes real problems for insurers. And generally speaking, insurers are happier with uncorrelated losses. That's normally what they seek to insure. That's much easier for them to calculate and to organize their business. With. And this is demonstrated when I look at the standard clauses. Sorry, uh, 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 here we go. Um, Okay, so generally speaking, businesses, although they buy business interruption insurance, so that's insurance to cover themselves against loss of profit, mostly they don't buy cover for these kind of correlated losses like pandemics for catastrophic losses. There are rare examples uh, uh, to the opposite. Uh, 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 so Wimbledon famously, I think this has now become the kind of known example, had bought um, every year for the last 17 years, insurance against having to cancel its event because of the breakout of a disease just like COVID-19. And so we're told it's paid about 25 million in premium. And so that money is going out and for every other year, it's, it's not got anything back in return for that. But this year, it was able to cancel the uh, uh, competition and recoup a large amount of its lost profits. So we're told about 114 million because it had this insurance in place. Now, most organizations did not buy that bigger, wider, extended cover that Wimbledon had bought. So if you do the maths on this, Wimbledon were kind of, uh, in terms of premium to, to, to return, it was a kind of one in 80, roughly kind of risk. If, it, if, it, if the pandemic occurred, something like there's more than one in every 80 years, it was a good investment. Um, if it didn't occur within 80 years, then it was a bad investment. But it, it, it was happier knowing that it was covered uh, for this kind of risk. So most insurers do not offer the kind of thing that Wimbledon offered. Even if they offer it, most insurers don't buy it. What most insureds buy in terms of business interruption insurance is damage to insured property caused by some kind of physical harm. Okay, so 
that can be seen in the kind of standard terms. Now, the contracts vary from insurer to insurer. So uh, what I've got here are some uh, examples of the kind of clauses that you would see in the market. And they have the kind of uh, common themes and trends that I, uh, that I identified uh, earlier on. So if we look on the left hand column for standard business interruption cover, this is the kind of insuring clause. So this is the kind of big promise that the underwriter makes to say, this is what we do. And of course, there will be a long document that follows on from this with caveats and limits and so on. But, but this is the kind of heartbeat, the center of the of the policy. So it says the company will indemnify the insured for gross profit as a result of interruption of or interference with the business carried on at the premises in consequence of damage to property. So that's the crucial bit. It's for losses to your profit in consequence of damage to property used by the insured. So in order to be able to recover at the moment for some kind of uh, uh, COVID-19 loss, you would need to prove under the standard policy that there was some kind of property damage. Now, this isn't an accident that this is here. Normally, property damage is the kind of thing that we would see as being uncorrelated. So if you have a fire at your restaurant in Lincoln, it doesn't make it more likely that there will be a fire at a restaurant in Bristol. If there is a tornado, it might hit a particular location, but it's not going to hit everywhere in the country all at the same time. So most of these kinds of losses that cause property damage are reasonably located in a small geographic area. Sometimes it might only be one or two properties, sometimes it might be 20, but it's not going to affect the whole of the country all at the same time. So insurers have deliberately designed this cover so that it didn't tend to pick up the, the kind of issues that hits everyone all at the same time. If you wanted that kind of extended cover, you had to go and buy additional policy or, or, or get an extension of your existing policy and that would of course cost you more money okay so the, the wider the cover you want uh, the more expensive it will be and here i have on my right hand column the standard terms produced by the association of british insurers so the, the trade body for the insurance industry some kind of sample clauses and these would need to be tweaked and amended for a particular uh, policy but these are the kind of starting points so it will cover you in addition to property damage for occurrence of a notifiable disease at the premises. It will cover you under B for the discovery of an organism at your premises, which is likely to result in a notifiable disease. So you find a virus in your particular restaurant or pub or hotel. It will cover you for the loss of profit caused by that. It will also cover you, and this is quite important in the current circumstances, for the occurrence within a defined geographic region. And here the individual parties would have to negotiate what they want that to be. So the first suggestion is either in the town or borough, so you would name it, so you would say within Southampton, and you would define that by uh, relation to maybe the local authority region. Or if, you, your, if your, uh, your restaurant is in the middle of the countryside, you don't really have a, a kind of neighbouring region, you could say, well, within a radius of 25 miles. But you would negotiate some kind of geographic limit. And then you would say, well, if there's a notifiable disease within that uh, zone, within that region, then the insurer will pay out. But for your loss of profit, that is in a consequence of the occurrence of that notifiable disease. OK, so we'll need to show which kind of contract we have, which kind of policy we have. And we'll then need to try and work out what kind of losses will fall within this. Just because you have an insurance policy does not mean that your insurer is liable. You have to show as the insured that the particular event that occurred fell within the limits of the contractual promise. So there's some really interesting, genuinely interesting and important contractual questions going on. Okay, so if we think about the kind of things that are likely to get litigated, and to be clear, we know this is going to be litigated. The regulator, the Financial Conduct Authority, has announced that it will be bringing some test litigation. Uh, and I suspect within a, a, a matter of weeks, probably rather than months, we're going to see the courts uh, looking at exactly these kinds of issues and in some detail. And there, and there are billions of pounds of potential liabilities uh, uh, riding on the decision. So uh, within the standard cover, we saw that you had to show some sort of property damage. 
So let's imagine that we have a worker who's gone in, working in the kitchen and we can show that they had a coronavirus uh, and that that has been left in some way on a work surface. OK, so we have an infected premises. Is that damage to property? Now, your instinctive response might be no. No, this doesn't look like damage to property at all. Um, property's not been damaged. Well, and I think that's probably right. But there is there are cases where uh, asbestos dust has been treated as property damage. And there's also been discussion about whether certain types of nuclear radiation might constitute property damage. So some sort of contaminant might count. The general view, I think, is that a virus is not enough to count as property damage, but uh, that's a matter for the court. The other question would be, even if we can show this is property damage, what's the cost of remedying that? Well, how long would we have to be closed for? If we'd only have to close for 48 hours at a hotel or a restaurant while we can't clean the surface and make sure there was no active virus, you aren't going to be able to recover for you know, two months of lockdown costs because the property damage only caused two days worth of losses and you'll only be able to recover for those two days worth of losses. So that kind of discussion, what are the limits of cover and how much can we say the damage economic harm suffered was caused by the infection, that's likely to be really at the uh, heart of the uh, litigation, which we'll see in the court shortly. Where the insured has bought the wider extended cover and said this doesn't happen very often, this will be fairly rare cases, we'll then have questions about, well, was COVID-19 a notifiable disease? And those are some factual questions. It's the, it's the state, it's the authority. So in this case, Public Health England that, that declares COVID-19 a, a, a notifiable disease. And from that point onwards, you might think that you have cover. Now I've seen some insurers say that it had to be a notifiable disease on the day you bought the policy, not at the day of the loss. So that notifiable diseases is fixed as a list. It's only those things that were notifiable, um, say in November last year when you bought your one year policy. Uh, I think that must be wrong. The, the general approach in this kind of situation is to assume that these lists are dynamic so that something has to be notifiable disease at the time of the loss, not at the time the contract was made. But that's a matter fundamentally for uh, uh, the courts to engage in a process of contractual interpretation. OK, so what we have is a uh, potential uh, litigation hotspots uh, and the courts will be looking at the contract fundamentally to uh, answer these questions on the basis of uh, established principles of insurance contract law. But before we move on we need to understand that insurance contracts are not just contracts. So they have a, a significant level of regulation which, which overlays the contractual relationship. You can't just look at the contract terms, you also have to look at the codes of conduct and the rules uh, uh, that are made by the regulator, so that's the Financial Conduct Authority. It's also really important, and this is something we study in quite some detail at master's level, to understand that there are dispute uh, resolution systems beyond the courts. So the Financial Ombudsman Service, which was created in the early 2000s, decides disputes on insurance, mortgages and other kind of financial services areas on the basis of law and good practice. So even if the insurer is right in law, it doesn't have to pay this claim if it went to court. The Ombudsman can still say, well, you're right in law, but I don't think it's good for the industry. It's not good practice to deny this claim. You should still nonetheless pay this claim. So the limits of the ombudsman's practice is also going to be very important in dealing with COVID-19 claims. It's not enough just to understand the, the kind of formal legal uh, issues. OK, so that brings to an end my discussion of the kind of current pandemic and how it's likely to lead to business litigation, uh, business uh, uh, interruption uh, uh, litigation in the English courts. Uh, happy to take questions now. Uh, otherwise, uh, I will hand over to Professor Kahn. Uh, 
Okay, well, I'm not seeing immediately any uh, questions popping up, which is absolutely fine. Uh, I'll be staying on the call, so uh, please do ask me any questions that arise uh, uh, in the Q&A at the end. Otherwise, I will hand over to Professor Carl. Thank you for your attention. Um, Daisy, I think the, the slides have jumped forward. Thank you. Uh, thanks, James. That, that was very interesting. Um, it actually goes to show that there is a lot of litigation going to come up. There's going to be a lot of room for lawyers. And so that, that feeds quite nicely into my talk. And I, my name is Uta Kohl. Um, I'm Professor of Commercial Law and the director of Taught Postgraduate Program at Southampton Law School. And I will be just outlining very briefly, really the, the, the broad setup of, of the programs. There will be plenty of time for questions later on. Um, and uh, yes, those questions can be either about the program or about James's lecture or about anything else um, relating to being a student. Um, now, um, um, I, I, I just thought I'd start off with um, <sighs> the fact that Southampton Law School has been within the top 20 uh, law schools uh, in the UK, uh, according to the Times and Sunday Times Good University Guide of 2020, and uh, we've had good rankings um, according to other guides. The reason why I wanted to start off with that is that really it is, it's indicative of how much we care about the quality of our teaching, the quality of our research, and that really underwrites everything we do. And that hopefully will be reflected in your experience when you, when you come and join us. Now on the slide, you also see a little picture of what is actually the entry to the law school. Um, it's a sunny day, much like today. Um, yes, and that's really all I wanted to say on that slide. Okay. Um, now, Southampton Law School, uh, at the postgraduate level, really all modules are, broadly speaking, research-led modules. That really means that you will be taught by people whose, whose core expertise lies in the area they are teaching you, and who publish in those areas to take, to take part in debates at international and national level. I don't mean debates as in formal debates, but in conferences and so on. And, um, and we are hoping to engage our students in these, in these sort of cutting at edge questions. Very often those actually pop up at the dissertation stage when you are encouraged really to engage with um, what, what are the, the, the most controversial aspects possibly of, of, a, of a particular legal area. Uh, now, why take an LLM? Obviously, you have already thought about why you want to do an LLM. From our ex perspective, um, an LLM is, um, so what we are sort of investing into the program and what our ambition is to pass on to you is, first of all, of course, the specialized expertise. Yeah, so you will be learning about quite, um, um, a quite high, high, um, highly in, um, specialized subjects uh, taught by specialized teachers. Uh, but apart from the special expertise, we also hope and I think succeed in um, sort of furthering your skills. And those skills are either oral communication skills, written communication skills, constructing legal arguments, constructing arguments. Um, 
engaging in, in, in team exercises or certainly participating in seminars and so on. Yes, yeah, so there will be all sorts of skills which you will hopefully be developing um, during, during your LLM. Um, the other thing, most of our LLM students come from non-common law legal systems. So we are very conscious of the sort of steep initial learning curve um, they have to engage in. We are, of course, very supportive. The, the, the whole course will start off with a one week intensive introduction to common law and that will, you will be practicing that really throughout, throughout your degree. Um, that really relates to another point I wanted to mention and that is that um, our, our postgraduate cohort is exceptionally diverse and international. We, we literally have people from all corners of the world, which makes it a great, I think, a great experience to teach. But I would assume also it makes a great experience for students to interact with young people from from the rest of the world. So it's um, it's. Um, we have some British students, but most of our students come from abroad. And of course, finally, there's also the opportunity to research, but I will come to that in a second. Uh, now, this really gets me to the, uh, brings me to the uh, sort of nitty gritty of what you have to do during your year. And really the year is a full calendar year. It starts in in late September and it finishes in mid mid September when you hand in your dissertation. Now the first the first um, I'm trying to think how many months the first uh, nine months will be spent eight nine months well you will be taught you have modules you have you go to classes. Um, our, our semesters are 10 weeks long and you will have eight contact hours per week, which doesn't sound a lot, but actually our experience from students is that they, they feel that the, the course is too, there's, there's too much material to cover. But this is part, part of our sort of quality ambition that we do think actually, when you come here, you should have an intense experience of um, of learning. Um, this is not to say that you won't have time for socializing, but the course will certainly be, and those modules will certainly be demanding. For a lot of the classes, you are expected to do prior reading. There will also be seminars in which you will have to answer problem questions in groups. Um, and, then, and then at the end of each course, you will have an exam. Some courses will be assessed by an essay, but our preferred method of assessments are exams and students cope with that okay. Now from, um, uh, from the end, no, from the sort of middle of June, beginning to middle of June till September, you will uh, spend time on a dissertation. The dissertation counts a third towards the overall degree. Um, the dissertation will be resting on the initial classes which you will have had in the court on common law methodology, which have of course already been, will have been consolidated through all the other classes, substantive classes you've had. You will also be getting um, specific classes on research methods and writing skills. And in fact, it's Professor Davy who gives these classes. Um, a lot of our students have actually rather surprisingly little experience in writing extended essays. Um, this dissertation is um, the expectation that is that it's between 12 and 15,000 words long. So it is on a, it's a, it's a fairly lengthy um, piece of work. Um, the topic you can, you are free to choose within limits. So we we do exercise some control in making sure that you are picking um, feasible topics, topics that are manage manageable in, in light of what you have learned and what you will be able to do in a, in a limited amount of time. Uh, now, the dissertation, I always think of that, the dissertation as really quite a unique opportunity for anyone to, to do to do intensive research on a particular topic you are interested in, 
to express your own thoughts and views on it and do it in a, in a supportive environment where you actually have a, have a supervisor who will say, no, this is not a good argument, this doesn't work, this is good, and so on. So this, this is really something fairly, um, I, don't, I don't suppose it's fair, it's not exceptional in the university context, but it's exceptional in the life context, because later on in, in professional practice, there will be very few opportunities where you have such a supportive environment when you're, when you're writing things. Now that's the, that's an overview of the general setup of our LLMs, and we will be offering basically we are offering three LLMs: one in maritime law, one in international commercial and corporate law, and then one general LLM master for master of laws. The general LLM basically allows you to pick any modules of your choice, there are no restrictions on it. For the other two, given that they are themed in a way, theme programs, we expect you to go to have a preponderance of modules within those themes. Now, for the international commercial and corporate law, um, well, it's, the, it's I've, I've, I've listed here uh, the modules, the key sort of modules which come with that theme. So you have corporate governments, corporate insolvency, the law on the WTO, insurance law, um, arbitration law, business finance, and so on. Um, in addition, so you will have to choose the preponderance of your modules from this list, but on top of that, or not on top of it, but you have the opportunity to also choose uh, one or two modules from the other program. And then the main program would be maritime law. And a lot of the modules in maritime law are, of course, of great relevance to a general international commercial and corporate law uh, degree. And I will, I will show you in a second. Or if you have some interest in maritime law, but you don't want to do an LLM in maritime law, you might also decide to, to pick up some of the modules in maritime law, um, which are maritime law specific. Yeah. Uh, now, I've given here just an example of a potential dissertation topic just to show you um, that we are encouraging um, uh, to, 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 to uh, students, our students to basically pick up on very current and current topics um, that, are, uh, that really challenge not just the sort of the understanding of a particular legal discipline, but how this discipline applies or some of the rules of this discipline apply to particular novel phenomenon. And here one of the examples is how would competition law or does competition law effectively address the problem of online, online monopolies? Um, I, I suggest the answer may be no. Uh, but then the, 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 the further question would be, why not? What could be done to change it? Should something be changed and so on? And then finally, for international commercial and corporate law, you also have here a few career opportunities, what particularly you might consider doing later on. So that, in, of course, the starting point is national and international law firms. But, you know, we encourage our students to think beyond those very, uh, I suppose the expected um, professions in a way or prospected and em expected employers. So you could also become an in-house corporate lawyer, work in the bank or insurance sector, or even the public sector. So there are lots and lots of opportunities. Now um, I will be going through. Oh, this is this slide is just for your information. What we are offering under maritime law. So some of these modules, you would be allowed to pick one or two of these modules, um, even if you studied LLM commercial, international commercial, and corporate law. Yeah, uh, but these modules are really the key modules for our maritime law students. Um, and then this is master, the Masters of Law, so I go through that quickly. Um, th this is just um, a slide on the further opportunities you will have 
when you when you join us so we have a number of very active research centers uh, in particular the private and commercial law center which is again headed by professor davy that very regularly invites guest speakers or has speakers from our school uh, to present and all our postgraduate students are invited to come along perhaps of more interest would be the strong links we have with the legal profession and here I'm thinking particularly of the recruitment fair so we very very regularly um, invite first of all invite practitioners to give seminars but then we also have um, have a recruitment fair where a whole host of potential employers come and you can speak to them and um, and see where where your employment opportunities may lie may lie if you decided to stay, I suppose, in the UK. Um, um, last but not least, there are a couple of things I wanted to mention. One is our pre-sessional program, which we have, which runs every summer. It's a six-week six week long program, which is designed to uh, basically, uh, it's designed for foreign students. It's designed for students whose first language is not English. So it's a way of um, improving your English before the course begins. And in particular, uh, it will give you access to sort of English, uh, English legal terminology, which might, would be very useful uh, later on. Uh, I've already mentioned the intensive one week introduction to com the common law system, so I don't need to talk about it. We also have other student activities. One of the things is that there's the LLM challenge. There's every year when we when we um, invite all students to 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 basically group in teams and to debate against each other. Um, it's it's a fun event um it's students it's very good for making friends but it's also very good for practicing your oral um, communication skills um, this uh, should not be of interest to you given that you've already been made an offer um living in southampton um it's a great city to be in. It's it's very busy. It's has got um, all opportunities you would expect from a from a busy city. But it's also very close to the sea. Weather is great, and there will also be this is the last slide. This is the accommodation. You have a choice of rooms and <clears throat> ways, places where you could where you could find your accommodation. Uh, from, you know, partly catered to self-catering um, and so on. Um, I think that that concludes my presentation. Um, here, if you have, I mean, it, the, we are now running a Q&A session, but do feel free to get in touch with me um, if you need, want to, if you have any questions later on. Very happy to answer them. Um, if I can, or to refer, refer you to anyone who can answer your question. Okay, thank you. I think that's it. Hi, um, I'm back. Thank you very much, Professor Cole, for that introduction to the programme and that additional information, which I'm sure you find incredibly helpful. And also a little bit earlier, thank you very much to Professor Davy for that really quite insightful and illuminating discussion of the impact of current events on the insurance market. Um, so this is now the opportunity that if you do have any questions um, that you have the opportunity to ask them and one question which has already come up and I think Professor Cole has touched on it a little bit concerns potential topics for dissertations but I don't know whether James Professor Dobie has any insight as dissertation coordinator so Professor Dobie has the task, the role every year in recent years for allocating students and identifying the most appropriate supervisor 
for students' choice of dissertations. And it's probably worth highlighting that you have considerable choice in dissertation subject matter here. And Professor Davy will do everything he can to support that choice and put sterling effort into seeking to match up students with the best qualified, most expert supervisor in the field. So, James, do you have any examples of particularly striking dissertation topics which have been done this year or last year that you'd like to mention at this point? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things we ask students to do is to really find something that they have a passion for. So I think that's the, the driving idea. Um, students will often say to me, oh, I want to do something that, that an employer will be impressed by. And I will say, well, then do something well. And the easiest way to do something really well is to do something you really care about. Um, so there is, I think, often a, a, a real interest in either uh, litigation, which has just occurred or which is in the process of occurring. So students can often track a big case that they know is going to the courts and, and write a dissertation to say what they would do to imagine themselves as judge. Um, uh, we also see students often really interested in, in looking to track either recent or forthcoming technological developments. So AI, the idea of autonomous ships or autonomous cars or uh, changes in technology are, are often really popular. So what we have, I think, is uh, a system of encouraging students to find the thing that they're really interested in. Um, we give them gentle encouragement and suggestions uh, through the lectures that I deliver, but it's their project. And it's, it's so when students say, oh, well, can you pick something for me? The answer is always no, because I don't know what you really care about. So it's, it's about making sure that students, as they come towards the end of their talk modules, are able to hone in on those things that they're most interested in. Uh, to specialise in that, and most students, I think, really enjoy writing the dissertation. Probably not in the middle of writing it, but once it's done, there's a real sense of, kind of pride of, well, I did this, and I now have an expertise that means I can walk into a room and know that I've read more on this subject than anyone else has done. Uh, so I think it's great if you're going for, a, for a, a, an employment or an interview or something like that. So uh, they're often real world, they're about real issues, real problems but we, we help students write about them in a really thoughtful uh, and academic way. Uh, if I could just add to that, actually, and whilst we, we don't tell students what they should do, very often students come with very broad topics and there we might offer some guidance of how it might be narrowed and might be made more feasible. So um, I suppose I'm trying to say you won't be left to your own devices to come up with a good question. I think the nice thing is by the time you get to that point of the year, students know their staff. So unlike at some places where uh, you might have a sense that the professors never speak to you, that they come in, they give the lecture and they walk out without talking to me. I know a lot of the students really quite well. They talk to me about what they're interested in. It's, it's become something in which you can have that nice, friendly conversation with someone to say, oh, that's a really good idea. Or mm, I don't know how I do that in three months. So we, we use our experiences as, as academics, as authors, to help them shape a project that looks about the right size. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much, James and Uta, for that. And actually what James has just said really, I think, goes to what lies partly at the heart of the answer to one of the other questions which has emerged, which is, what is the culture of the school like? And I think that really in answering the question, what's the culture of Southampton Law School? I think it is important to first highlight what Professor Davey has just said, that actually there is quite a significant on emphasis on ensuring that students actually get to know their lecturers, their professors, their teachers, their tutors, their personal academic tutors. And the school is sized um, in a way, which means that we have a sufficiently broad range of expertise and real expertise um, in particular around maritime and commercial law areas. But while maintaining that breadth and depth of expertise, we're also of a su sufficiently, we're not huge, which means that staff and students all get to know each other individually. And that's something that we really place a great value on, that sense of academic community 
um, that we strive to build. And I think it's particularly um, important for postgraduate students who are looking ahead while they are here and who are with us for a relatively short period, that sense of getting to know each other and then developing, I think, the other part of the culture of the school is a real emphasis, which Professor Cole touched on earlier, that emphasis on academic excellence and research and rigor. Um, the fact that almost all of the academic staff in the school are research active and are expected to be actively researching in the fields in which they are teaching. That's why we teach those areas, because we research in those areas. Um, and so that pushing not only for excellence in what we do as academics, but also pushing our students to achieve their potential and to deliver what they can, you know, to achieve the best that you can achieve as students. And that's really important and it's part of that recognition of the individuals within the school and the development of individual relationships. I don't know whether you would like to add something there. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add that we also have um, a system of personal tutors, so there is a fair bit of pastoral care going on as well, so if, if any of our students has any problems or sick or needs to go home, there's always a contact point and in fact you're encouraged to be in touch with your personal tutor. Um, that person would also often be your, your if you need a reference, you, someone you can approach. So we do, um, we do look after our students even in a pastoral way and not just on an, on an academic level. And I would say uh, there is not an entirely open door policy, but all of our staff have office hours and students are encouraged to, to go along. And lots of students take that opportunity. And, you know, I for one enjoy my contact, the contact with students, whether it's in the class or outside the class. So um, I, I'd, I'd say it's a very friendly law school. Yeah. Okay. If I can add one small other thing, as one of the other things I do is to talk about you know, LLMs on other careers fair. One of the crucial things for students, I think, to understand is kind of class size. And that's something that Emily, uh, uh, Professor Reid mentioned a moment ago. There are places that say, oh, look, we have all these seminars. But when you look at class sizes, there are hundreds of people in the room. We don't do that. We have class sizes where you have an opportunity actually to take part. If it's a discussion group, it will not be enormous. You know, we run small group teaching. We run seminars that are reasonably limited in terms of size. And I think it's really important to recognize that that ability to take part in a proper debate when you're having a discussion group does not exist in all the levels. Yeah, I think that's very important. Um, so are there any other questions coming through? If you have any questions at this point, you can put them in the chat and ask them within the chat. But if there's nothing of immediate urgency that you would like an answer to, if something occurs to you afterwards, then obviously you can contact, as we've already said, Professor Cole and her contact details were on the slide a moment ago and I think will be shared again um, if there are any further questions. So final opportunity for now. Are there any further questions? And I'm not seeing anything so um, I would just like to thank you for joining us for this session and to look forward to welcoming you hopefully to Southampton in the coming months, or at least to Southampton Law School in the coming months. Thank you very much. Thank you as well from me.